afternoon and welcome to JCT's Fascinating Hobbies. Today we're going to be taking a look at this Nordmend Spectravision V500, also known as a JVC 7300 or 7700, I can't remember. Um, also has a, a lot in common with the Ferguson 3V23. So this is basically the Nordmend version of it. So I've plugged it in. Let's flick the power switch. And the good sign is we do seem to have a clock display. So let's take it out of standby. That's a good sign. And if we look inside here, you can see that the video lamp is lit. So we're going to use a test cassette. Probably the same one as last week. Let's see if it accepts the cassette. A good sign. And let's hit play. So like the ITT deck is just having some problems lacing up fully, so let's see if we can fast forward. Yep, fast forward is fine. Rewind is fine, let's try that playback again. So it does seem to stop at a certain point. Well, to be honest with you, that's not a bad thing. So, let's get the bottom off and see what's going on. So we've just got the bottom cover off and you can tell immediately that this machine is from a generation before. The circuit board count is a lot higher. Uh, density of components on the circuit boards is also a lot higher, as you can see here. And we're also using, if you look at the deck, an earlier version of the deck on the 3V31 clone, the ITT. Now one thing we can tell immediately is this capstan drive belt looks to be okay, in all fairness. So this is our loading drive belt here, complete with the uh, little worm drive. Very similar to uh, the one that we had on the, um, on the, uh, the ITT. So what we're going to do is we're just going to power on this machine again. So that's come on. Uh, let's put it out of standby. Now let's hit play. Let's see what happens to this. So uh, let's go in like that. And feel it still spinning. Yeah. So it's exactly the same as last time as far as I can tell. So let's hit play again. So there may be a problem with one of the other pulleys as well, so the idler pulley may be at fault. So I don't think unfortunately I've got another of these drive belts, but we will go and have a look. Um, we'll also see if we've got an idler pulley, because I think that idler pulley might also be uh, at fault. So, let's go and see if we have a suitable belt. What we will do is we'll actually take that belt off, and uh, we can go and compare the sizes of our other belts. So we've got a selection of belts. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is to see if we can actually remove uh, the actual cradle itself. So it's actually screwed in in one, two, uh, looking at it, two places from what I can tell. So Swap over my supporting post. 
and I've got so I would try to do the same thing that I did with the 3v31 clone but I keep saying 3v31 it's an ITT uh, VR3984 uh, which was to pop off the little um, circlip and bring out the axle that way so I can then get the belt off of the pulley but it's right up against this uh, metal bracketry here which is actually part of the deck and that makes things very difficult to um, to get out so I'm hoping that if I do that it will actually come out but that seems to be holding somewhere else as well so it's going to be rather interesting trying to uh, to get this out I think it might be held in here as well and yes it is so move actually that's interesting because that moves this bracket out of the way so we may not actually need to take this out completely because obviously this is meshed into the loading mechanism the loading arms and I don't really want to go messing up the sink on that because it will be a pain to get it back again so what I'm going to do Carefully move this out of the way, put this back in place, screw it all down again. Hoping I can screw it down for a sec. in sort of the right area that should pull it back into shape like so there we go so what this should enable me to do is gently get this loom out of the way like so so I can move the wiring loom over a little bit like so and that now gives me access to this little circlip let's swap over these again should be able to do is gently pop it off like so that's on the verge of popping off Turn it around. A little tease like so. And there we are. She's just about off. So we'll use these needle nose pliers. And we will go in and recover the little circlip as we've done there. Now what that should enable us to do is like last time, pop out the little axle like so the head will get in the way again very likely but that should give us enough play in this to get the belt out so take the pulley off there or the belt rather move the pulley around in fact what we can do 
is we can loosen off this bolt at the top here or this nut screw rather if we loosen this off it should allow us to move it out of the way like that and then even that's actually not giving us enough leeway in my eye So that may have actually given us a bit more. Yeah, it's just wedging it up against there, so we can put that back again. It might actually be easier to service this out of the machine. I didn't really want to do this, but I'm hoping if I move that out of the way, this can lift out like so. There we go, and that gives us enough leeway to pull that out and do that. Now what we can do are a couple of things. Make a loud noise in the background with the bottom lid of the machine. But also, we can have a look at this belt and see if we can find a suitably sized belt to replace it. And it looks like we've got one. So we're going to keep a note of this size. So this is a 28.5 millimeter belt. And what we'll actually do is we're actually going to write onto this what it is. So we know that this one is a JVC load, uh, sorry, lace belt. I know what that means, and it just means that when I want to come and reorder this uh, for some of my other machines, I don't know what to service, um, I've got the correct size. Because there are a lot of people that like to try and rejuvenate belts. But I think rubber gets to a certain age where it's not really going to come back again in any way or as good as it did once before. This might actually be a little bit thick and possibly not actually big, not actually big enough. Let's have a look. So obviously these belts are going to expand and stretch with age. They might be okay. So where's our pulley? Here it is. It's got this little bit of sandpaper. And what we're going to do is just like so, rough up the inner edge of the pulley, like so, where the belt actually goes. It just gives it a little bit more traction. And what we'll do when we're reassembled is, like we did last time, just plop a little bit of grease onto the, uh, the worm gear. So let's get the belt around. So we get the belt around the pulley itself. So it's ready to pull over the motor. And get the belt sat in. Sorry, get the pulley sat in there. Uh, we'll now take the little rod and we'll put the rod through the centre of the pulley, like so. So that's going to go through, oh, that's all going to fall off. That's going to go through like, like this. That should hopefully pop out the other side, like so. There we go. We can hook this up onto the motor. There we go. So that's ready to all latch in at some point. Looking at this, there's no actual um, preset on it. I think it's very much a case of put it in and it will sort itself out. There's obviously going to be a 
point a couple of micro switches which will tell you when the um, the machine's laced or the machine is unlaced that will be down to the machine itself so let's put this circlip back on circlip is back so just double check it like so there we go and now that we've got that done a little blob of grease so let's get that out of the way like that again use the screwdriver to wedge it in place we're going to put a blobette of grease on here and try and use some of that grease on this one like so so that should hopefully work its way, way work its way round the loading ring when the machine's in operation this makes things a little bit easier on the motor also on that belt so we'll drop that into there which it is going to do so that's like so and that is there so the first thing we'll do is we'll get this one and it might take a little bit of a fiddle so we'll let this one we'll put this one in first nip it up so slightly let's have a look and see where it is up there So I don't want to do it up fully because I want to have movement like that in the actual assembly. We'll take one of our other screws. I have to wedge this back in place slightly. Let's see. One of our other screws. And go down here. And that's out of kilter slightly. So that's about there for that one. Again, not down fully, just enough there. So we've still got movement. Now we've got the bracket tree, bracket which we will put into place, and we need our other little screw. Hopefully around somewhere. So we've got our other little screw. Mount it into the bracket. And the bracket goes, I believe, like so, if I remember rightly. So that goes over like so. And that a little bit of wriggling around settles into place there we go so make sure that stays centralized so that's settled into place quite nicely we can now tighten up these other ones like so okay what we can also do is put the wiring back in place so that's why you've got this bracket here is basically you've got quite a lot more Quite a large account of wiring on these older machines and uh, the wiring obviously runs down there so there's no wiring in that position or not a huge amount of wiring in that particular position on the the newer machines so obviously you don't need to have all of that extra metal work it's also cost saving as well so if you don't have to put that metal bracket in you are saving when making these machines at least a couple of uh, you know, a couple of pence. Incidentally, I think that's the micro switch uh, that we were on about earlier for that deck, for the loading lacing mechanism, rather. Right, a little blob of grease on that worm gear. 
not a huge amount because you don't want it leaching everywhere. Okay. And let's put the machine back into standby. Put it back in place. Uh, flick the power switch. Power is on. Out of standby. And let's hit play. That's healthier. And then it unlaces again. So that will probably because we got no, even no capstan rotation or no rotation of the idler. So what I'm going to do is to put this bottom board back in, put the bottom cover back on, which I'll actually show you how elegant it all is and how it goes together so very nicely. So we have a couple of screws for this bottom cover here. Um, I'm not actually sure what this circuit board does. This is a oh mech control. So this actually controls the deck. And being below the deck, it's actually a very logical place to put it. Uh, the newer decks, I think, have actually got all of that control. Um, it's actually on one of the boards that mounts directly under the machine, but it's actually part of a individual part of the board rather than taking up an entire board in its own right. So it really just sort of goes to show how sort of just in a couple of years, I think this machine is a 1981 deck, and the VR3982 is a 1983-ish. 84 ish deck. It just shows how, in that sort of short period of time, Moore's law of miniaturization has uh, sort of taken, taken uh, hold, so to speak. So that literally goes on there. Now, what you've got here is you've got a lateral sort of little tuner module. And if I bring that out, this actually all that that is, if I just turn the machine off. It. Where's the on-off switch? This <laughs> pulls out, so you can easily replace it. Which I think it's rather nifty. I'm not sure if um, this was done in this particular way so that this machine would work in other regions with different frequencies or not, so I'm not sure why in this particular series of machine it's like this, but that just goes and latches in like so and there it is, it all looks very nice, all goes together really well so then we've got these little feet, and the feet actually double as the um, screws that hold on this bottom plate so we will screw these in I tend to do this in a diagonal form, much like you would do if you were uh, either sort of putting a sump back onto a car or doing a head cylinder head, putting a cylinder head back on. You usually sort of do it in a cross motion, uh, working sort of like one, two, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you've got eight head bolts, she didn't see that. So that was so one two sorry one two three four five six seven eight if you've got eight head bolts obviously if you have more head bolts you would do it in a different pattern but generally uh when you're sort of talking down things that need to remain flat that's uh, the way that you would generally do it this is just a video recorder so it doesn't need that kind of careful attention, even though it is a precision piece of engineering. But it just, you know, it satisfies the uh, inner nerd in me, to be honest. The nerd more sort of outer, loud and proud and out there nerd, really. <laughs> right, let's get this up. Uh, this machine weighs a lot. It's around 22 kilograms. It's very heavy very well engineered piece of machinery. So I've got my selection of drive belts and various things here. 
Uh, that's for a free V31, not sure what that is. These are the capstan belts that we had last week. That's the old drive belt for the um, loading pulley. That is a pinch roller. It's for a free V29, but it might work in this. And these are not actually relevant here, but they are belts for the Hitachi VT11 and 14. May also work on the VT17. I've got a VT17. There. Underneath the VT11. So I've actually got a VT11 and a 17. I've also got a 14 as well. Uh, that's a different story. Anyway. The strange thing about the VT17 is it's. Uh, supposedly the top of the range deck so it has long play and it's a front loader but it doesn't have linear stereo sound whereas the 17 uh, sorry the 14 does which is really odd so we've got the, uh, the top cover off now you can see inside the machine more clearly now this top board here is the color amp assembly so this is effectively, I believe, the video control board. Now, I think this board on the side is... Uh, that's another servo board. And there is going to be a board around somewhere that controls the audio. Now, as we've discussed before on numerous videos, the audio on these is quite complex and over-engineered because the times 2 speed actually plays back the sound as well n times two speed and it uses something called a bucket brigade device apparently the actual training course for it was um a day in its own rights when these machines were new and uh obviously all of the engineers were being trained on them so there is another board back here and i'm not sure what that one is Incidentally, the entire machine is very clean inside. It all looks very clean, it's very tidy. Um, I might have the schematics somewhere. I've got, uh, what's this? So, this is the service manual for this machine. It's fine, it's for a 3V23, but it's broadly the same deck if we're going to be perfectly honest now 9.5 is the audio section so where's 9.5 that's section 8 um, To be honest with you, it's quite important to know which board is the audio board because some of the capacitors on there can go bad and cause um, a loss of audio or certainly audio warbling and a certain degree of woe and flutter in um, operation. That's section 10, troubleshooting. Why I like service manuals because you've got all of the values of the capacitors, the resistors, the transistors, everything for the machine. So you don't have to do what I've had to do recently and actually go. Oh, that's 9.5 circuit board audio assembly. So there may actually be a schematic that tells us which board is which. Here we are. So we've got so this board on the side is servo 2 this is the YC board here so that one this one here that's the YC board uh, we've got the power supply board we've got the mech control board which we've seen already we've got the pre-rec uh, pre-rec board assembly which is this one here, which you can't see me pointing at, but it's there behind the head. Audio board assembly is, as I thought, this one right at the back of the machine. 
So if we have any problems of audio, this is the one that we're going to be turning our attention to. And this is why it's really useful to have one of these. They come up on eBay every once in a while. They do cost um, a fair amount, depending on who is selling it. So if somebody's selling it who knows what they're selling, they will charge a premium for it. Typically, I tend to have to pay about £30 uh, for a service manual. Um, but to be honest with you, I only tend to buy the ones for the machines which I'm having to deal with. And uh, it's money well spent, in my view. But I don't have one for the C7 at the moment, so I need to get one of those. So let's hit play, and let's see what's happening to that tape. Hmm. Okay. I think I've scared it into working. Uh, let's try some of the shuttle search functions. Let's try the pause function. Uh, oh, it's got a slow function. Oh, yeah, there it is. And if we put it back to play, we've also got our X2 function. There we go, and stop. Oh, no, that's the wrong button. There. So if we hit rewind and eject. That seems very happy. What we're going to do now is we're going to reassemble the machine and we're going to whip out the Pi and test the actual playback, see if she's working okay. So this one so far has just needed a new um, loading belt for the um, for the actual uh, loading gear on the machine itself. Now I've just noticed that those are a little bit dry grease-wise. So for the posts, obviously bring the cassette around the head. So we will apply a little bit of grease to each of those. And let's put the tape back in. And let's lace it up. And let's unlace. looks happy. Right, what we need to do now is we put this piece of RF shield uh, back here, like so, and we gently drop down our YC board. Like so. Obviously, once that's in place, we can screw it down. So I'm just going to pause this and get the machine reassembled, ready for the final test. Now, there's actually a little trick with putting this shield back on, because where is it? I think here you've got a big fat uh, delay line, and there's a cutout in the RF shield which actually goes over the delay line. So if you mount this onto the board and then drop the whole assembly down 
it fits perfectly and then you can screw it in there's also a little um a little earthing thing on top of the head uh, which also sort of goes into um, the RF shield as well and just for putting it all together like that just means it goes into it together a bit better right let's get the top cover on so we've got the machine back together and uh, we're uh, just going to give it a bit of a go and see what happens so let's see if we've got any sound well that's quite high volume wise let's fast forward it a bit so we're not waiting yeah we've got sound not bad sound at all actually let me just mute it so we don't get a copyright strike now last week we were discussing this at the top of the screen now I initially thought it may be all at the uh, the venerable pie but um, on further investigation having discussed with a number of people who've had experience in these machines there are two well several well two several things it could be number one I've got the VCR underneath the telly. Now the scan coils in some circumstances can affect the way the heads work on the video recorder. Now that is a possible reason, possible cause for this particular issue and um, certainly let's see what happens if we lift the telly up. The fault does actually seem to clear, so oh no, it doesn't. It's also never a good idea to lift a CRT whilst it's in operation. Um, the other thing, which I did notice, if I eject uh, the tape, somebody said it could be the tape it's actually on is not really in the best shape. So a lot of these pre-recorded tapes uh, they didn't use the best quality tape and you can sort of see well, you might not be able to actually but there are ripples running all the way across the actual tape material itself so again that could be causing the problems as well so let's try out the x2 mode So we're going to put the sound on, hit X2. Brilliant. A feature that you did not see very often at all on video recorders, but just means you can actually watch it in two times speed. You might need to fiddle about with the tracking a little bit. So if we hit fast forward search, it's working well. So we do have noise reduction. Which I think works. I will assume it works. Got a dimmer for the clock as well, which is nice. I didn't know Mum that well, did I? When she died, I was just a little nipperoonie, all on soft and eczema. Now you feel a sense of personal loss. Me, I'm just feel cheated. And it's working well. So on the whole, touch wood, this machine's actually working really well. I'll just mute the sound again. So, that is the Nordmend V500 SpectraVision. This is the remote control for it, which, if you look at it, controls pretty much every single function on the machine, including the slow motion, 
the shuttle search, the X2 search, but what is also quite unusual for a machine of this era, all of the programming functions as well. Now, as I said last week, the machine that replaced this was the um, 7650. So I think this is a 76, JVC 7600. And the um, one that replaced it was the 7650. In fact, I can actually tell you, because I've got this really good book, which is the complete video guide. And um, what is rather amusing is I have an example of each of one of the machines on the front cover. So we've got a C7, we've got a 3V23, which effectively this is. And we've got this Philips Video 2000 machine, which is very similar to uh, the Pi that I've got. So let's have a look in the, the book here. Covers all formats, Betamax, Video 2000 and VHS. So here's our Nordmend V500. Um, it's identical, that's right, no, I do apologise, it's a JVC HR7700. So it's identical to the HR7700. Um, it's also identical to the Ferguson 3V23 or the Akai VS10. And it's at a slightly lower price. So the price for this, average price, was £745 back in 1981. So here are the other clones. So there's the Akai ES, sorry, VS10. That one was 699 so that was actually a bit cheaper. You then got the Ferguson 3V23, also £699. And there's no difference between this and the Ferguson, apart from uh, some of the aesthetics. Uh, the Ferguson has a slightly different front button arrangement, and the front flap on the Ferguson, this bit I'm flipping here, is a lot larger. It seems to cover more of the machine. We've got the JVC. Let's have a look for the JVC version. Uh, we don't seem to have the JVC version, so let's just flick through. Ah, there you go. So that's the JVC HR 7700EK, and that's £720. And if you look at it, apart from uh, the black treatment up here, again, it's identical to the Nordmend, which you see here. So if you bought the Nordmend back in 1981 but over the JVC Akai or Ferguson versions, you were you were quite rich because you were wasting the equivalent of um, an extra so a couple hundred pound or so to buy um, a machine that is effectively identical to uh, the other machines in the series. Um, Nordmend I believe at the time did make some sort of pretty high-end CRTs so obviously the price of the machine was um, uh, was sort of comparable to um, the sort of cachet that their televisions had. Uh, what else have we got in here? So the Sony C7 here, that was a bargain at £639. Uh, the value for money, it got 5 out of 5 stars. The sophistication was 4 out of 5. The design, 5 out of 5. It's also a lighter machine as well. And you could argue that it is um, slightly more uh, advanced circuitry-wise than not the Nordmend or JVC, uh, in that there um, is more on each circuit board. So each individual board carries more functions, like the boards underneath are a mixture of servo and chroma, uh, picture control, etc. Whereas on this uh, Nordbend, you've got an individual board for pretty much every single operation. Um, other machines, we've got um, 
some rather bizarre Akai thing, which uh, I think is another JVC clone. Uh, we've got this Nordmend, which is very similar to a JVC HR 3660, which is a bit like a Ferguson 3V, 3V16. So there's the JVC HR 3660. And there is the Ferguson 3V16. There's absolutely no difference, pretty much, apart from badging between the pair of them. So badging and colouring, certainly. Um, the remote control on those was pretty advanced for the time. It's a cable remote control, but it had, and this was unusual for again for sort of um, a piano key machine. It had slow fun slow motion facilities. So it really was quite an advanced machine, but you can sort of tell, certainly in 1981, it was more of a bottom-end machine because it was £549. Value for money was 2, Sophistication 2, Design 2. If we go back even further to some of the even simpler, more budget machines, so if we pick our base model Ferguson 3V22, so that was the... Basic, basiest, lowest spec VHS machine you could get at the time. You were looking at £499. And incidentally, we've actually got a couple of those in the shed, which we will be taking a look at at some point and seeing if they actually work. But that really was the, uh, the bottom of the market. So, in comparison, if we have a look at the beta machines. So the lowest spec, uh, Piano Key Betamax, was this Sanyo 9300PN, and that was only £390 average price. Value for money, it got a 4 out of 5. Sophistication, 2. And Design, 3 out of 5. And that really was uh, a very cheap machine, but it did face stiff competition from Sony's All Electronic C5, which was £449. And the C5 looks identical to the C7, apart from colour, so the case colour. And uh, it had um, fewer features, so it didn't have some of the uh, trick features that the C7 had, nor did it have the multi-function, uh, multi-day timer. Alongside the C5 you had the PVC 700 and that was an NEC machine, very similar to the C5. The weird thing about it was um, its picture search was in colour as opposed to black and white. Now on the C5 the picture search was always in black and white but there is um, a transistor literally labelled colour mute transistor which you can remove apparently and you can get colour search, picture search on the C5, which is quite amusing, really. So they actually added a component to pitch it at the lower end of the market. Bonkers. Then you got the Sanyo VTC 5600P, which is one of their earlier um, all-electronic decks. You really don't see very many of these around. You see quite a few of the 9300s, but you don't see very many 5600s, which is a shame, because it's quite a handsome looking, uh, handsome looking beast. C7 was very popular. That was £639 average price. Um, but also the C7 had um, advanced recording of 14 days, four programmes, whereas the Sanyo had five programmes. 12 available channels, uh, infrared remote control, slow motion, picture search, and a direct camera input, which the Sanyo lacked. It did not have picture search or a direct camera input. So if you were going to spend the money, you probably would have gone for the C7, which I think a lot of people did, and that's why you don't see very many of these 5600s. From the Toshiba line, top range of the range Toshiba was the V8600, and that was the first video recorder, uh, consumer video recorder, to have four heads. Um, these do turn up from time to time, but they are very complex and a lot of the machines now are unfortunately quite tired, unless you're lucky enough to get uh, a boxed, brand new, almost example. 
Then you've got the Video 2000 decks, and there's far less Video 2000 decks than there are anything else. You've got the portables here, so you've got the Ferguson 3V24 and 25, the Hitachis, the JVC originating versions of the Ferguson units, uh, Panasonic's own take on the portable format, and the Sony portable. Now, this was replaced quite quickly by the SLF-1, and the SLF-1 really sort of kicked the rest of these into touch. This one did not really sort of get very good reviews, it was £725, value for money was not brilliant, sophistication, well, it wasn't really sophisticated at all, and design got a 2 out of 5, whereas the F1, which replaced this, is a much, much better machine, a much nicer machine. And these are obviously cameras that you can attach to either these VHS or Betamax machines. There's a lot more cameras for the um, VHS side of things, but you do have uh, other things for the Betamax format. So I've actually got one of these Sony uh, HVC 2000s. I think I've also got 3000 as well. Um, and again, you know, not bad at all. Nice cameras, produce quite a good quality uh, picture, especially when you couple it with the F1. It's got another section in this book, software. Literally, that is just all of the current releases which are available on cassette. And I think if we look, uh, do they differentiate between VHS Beta and Video 2000? I'm not sure if they do. But these were, this is sort of bonkers at the time, you could actually fit all of the um, films which were currently available into a book. Obviously fast forward a year on from this and you wouldn't be able to fit it in a book anymore unless it was a very big book. Um, it also <laughs> covers uh, adult titles which is quite funny. Um, so let's have a look at the adult titles. Oh you've got the Emmanuel, Daughter of Emmanuel. Um, what else have you got? Flesh Gordon. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, Emmanuel and Friends. Emmanuel 3. Oh, you got all the Electric Blue titles. That takes you back. That's Electric Blue 3 was featuring Britt Eklund and Marilyn Monroe. Uh, the Emmanuel ones were very famous back then. Yeah, there are. <laughs> there are loads of them. You know. If there's going to be a format that shows moving pictures, there's going to be something adult to go with it. Anyway, that is pretty much it for today. So that machine is working well. Everything's going quite nicely with that. So I've left this actually running for a little bit. And we're just going to see how we are sound-wise. All working well. And there we go. Anyway, if you have enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button and also consider subscribing for more upcoming hobbies. And once again, thank you very much for taking the time to watch. See you next time.